the barman came up to Monk and said, hey, Monk, it's one of those nights, hey, not many people. And Monk said, yeah, but you see all those invisible motherfuckers? <laughs> <laughs> Sirens busy driving, guess I'll make my move. Crazy feet on rubbing me. Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest is an accomplished piano player who has won many awards and is the man behind Sia. Welcome, the one and only Barney McCall. Hello, Barney. Hey, you how are you, man? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm certainly not the man behind Sia. Well, what did you actually, did you produce her or you actually worked, you, you, you her, collaborated? I was, her, I was her musical director for a little bit there, but um, okay. she doesn't need anyone behind her. <laughs> oh, I, what, what, oh, come on, she needs someone like your, you, mate. I mean, you've got the skill, you know, you've got the vision. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, she's she's got a lot of vision. But, I'm um, sure she has. I did help her out. I definitely yeah. did help her out. Yeah. But, um, yeah, she's got her own thing going on. I haven't, I haven't spoken to her for ages. Yeah, fair enough. That's what happens. But um, I want to start with... Um, how did two brothers get to train as musicians at an early age? Did you come from a musical family or? Um, grew up, you know, with my mum playing piano, my sister sang and my brother playing piano and also living nearby um, Len Bernard and the Bernard family. That was sort of instrumental because they, you know, Len Bernard dropped off all sorts of amazing records, so that helped but yeah, we used to have sing-alongs, and so, you know, just being involved in that helped me to get in, get sort of fall in love with music. And we had a piano, thank God. So, yeah, I suppose yeah. And also, John, my brother, did teach me a lot of shit. He also threw me off occasionally because um, he wanted to play. That must have been. Was it competitive with John, or was it <clears throat> pretty harmonious? Um, no, it was never competitive actually. Um, okay. He would just show me stuff. He showed right. me, Tom, go to bed, Tom, go to bed. Because I, I used to play <laughs> with this, um, these identical twins, the Tailby twins, and um, we didn't even know what – we used to play uh, Taking Care of Business, right, <laughs> back when Turner Overdrive. That was our <laughs> yeah, first right. song. Wow. And, um, and John came in and said, hey, look, check this out. This is jazz, right? He grabbed the stick off the drummer, Greg, and said, Tom, go to bed, go on the cymbal, right? So he kind of steered me into understanding this this stuff and he played me Bud Powell when I was probably about 11 years old and it was it changed my life. That very moment sticks in my mind. So, yeah, John, there was no com competition. It yeah, was just it John was, helping me. Great. That's terrific. And I guess for an 11-year-old to grasp that level of uh, jazz, Bud Powell, for instance, that you mentioned, I mean, you must have already had a quite an, uh, an eclectic taste of music by that stage. If you grew up uh, with the Bernard family, I didn't know, know if I, I don't know if the word would be grasp because <laughs> I suppose I was just under the spell of the of the complexity and beauty of it. Yeah, um, I was drawn to it, yeah. and I'm starting to grasp it now. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I I was you know because Len Bernard, as I said, would drop off albums like Pine Top Smiths, Boogie Woogie, Muddy Waters. Um, Mary Lou Williams. So I'm like an 11, well, I'm a seven-year-old kid in Murlbach in the eastern suburbs listening to some very hip shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I was, you know, Michael Jordan, the drummer, he, he also lived in the neighbourhood too. And I was saying to him, that's amazing, man, because uh, we just seem to bump into a whole lot of great musicians there in Murlbach. And he said, it could have been a lot worse. Yeah. Yeah, why, why was that? Why was there jazz musicians in that area? Was that because of the uh, the? Because I know around that area, the there was this whole push in the in the forties and fifties with a lot of artists moving out to um, yeah, Heidi Gallery. Yeah, is that sort yeah, of? I, would that be the same sort of thing? Do you think mm, with the music? Well, John reckons that you know our families kind of connect. We did know people who were um, in the in that group of artists. And we used to hang out with, well, my parents used to hang out with a lot of left-wing Labor members and drink a yeah. lot of wine and listen to Cat Stevens. And, <laughs> you know, so there, there was that. And, yeah. was, and there was theatre and dance. And my mum was really into culture and had all sorts of paintings. And my dad had thousands of books. 
So it's kind of amazing. It kind of helped us to even understand what culture is, you know, so that was great. That's a great upbringing. Um, just want to talk about um, your Global Intimacy album. Um, it was inspired by the Black Mirror series. Uh, and uh, one of the songs that stands out is When They Come For Us, which, is, which features uh, Daniel Merriweather. Um, just tell me a little bit about the complexity of the lyrics, because uh, in one of your, uh, on your Wikipedia, they sort of say that it's the thickest criticism against the evils of the corporatised music industry, technology, fascism and capitalism. So what does that song bring in relation to that? Mm. The, the title actually comes from a book, actually, but I think Daniel had seen a, that quote and we were hanging out in here, and um, obviously Daniel wrote the lyrics, and um, I feel like he would also say you can take what you want from them. They're not specifically related to anything unless you want them to be related to it. Um, for my feeling, it's kind of like, will you fight back? Will they come? The, the lyric goes, and when they come for, for us, will we be gone? Or, or will you be gone? Um, but it's kind of abstract. It's pretty abstract. Yeah. The album's pretty abstract. But it is a kind of fuck you to um, streaming services, um, YouTube, Google, Facebook, all posing as this kind of, you know, platform where you um, support the arts. But um, in actual fact, it's destroyed the arts on many levels. We yeah. still flounder around giving it all away for free. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because, um, like, I, I, I just recently started a Patreon page, right? And, and it's, it's a great thing for me. It, it's, it gives me something to do, but it also puts value on what I do as a musician and artist only because I don't have any gigs or, or any touring right now. And it's interesting because since joining that Patreon page, I'll have a Facebook page. I'll put a Facebook post up and it'll say, hey, Barney, you have 80% more engagement on this. Um, give us money, right? Yeah. And then we'll get you more likes. Yeah. But we'll take every skerrick and every cent of the ad money, right? And I was thinking, hang on a minute. I've actually fallen into this whole thing that I want validation and likes through an internet server and no one ever sees any bread from that. I mean, you tell me, could someone come to me and say, a musician, and say, yeah, I put all this money on, on publicising my album and I got so much back. Not one person ever said that. And so I just find it interesting and I actually posed the question on this, um, on that platform recently. I put up a question that said, hey, guys, now that um, the light has been shone on the fact that... Um, all these streaming services and these platforms, Google, you know, YouTube and Spotify, or whatever. Now that you can see that, you know, we've got nothing left and now they're making more, maybe more money than ever in this COVID terrible situation. Yeah. And we're making less money than ever. Could someone tell yeah. me why they, why they give everything away and stream it? Like give some things away. And there is an altruistic um, reasoning behind musicians. And I love musicians for that. But at the same time, for God's sakes, it's so clear now that we have to take another way, another route um, so that we can make any money to get any bread on the table because yeah. at this stage what we're looking at is free concerts everywhere Yes. and less money. So that's anyway, it's an interesting question, but I took the post down because I also felt that I don't want to rock the boat or I don't want to upset people who are already upset enough about the situation we're in. But it's an interesting question just to pose to you. That's a lot of information and I agree with you. But have you, have you gone through that uh, Bandcamp stream? Do you think that's any better than Facebook or any other way to sort of generate money for yourself with your records? I think Bandcamp is the best of, of a bad bunch in a way. Yeah. Um, I do appreciate that they have a sort of elegant platform and they don't take too much and I think it's the best thing going right now but I think that there will be other platforms and they're already being thought about um, because it's absolutely ridiculous the divide right now and 
we've kind of woken up from this capitalist nightmare and gone, hang on a minute, we're still giving it all away and now we're, we don't even have any gigs, we don't have any touring, we have... So there must be some other ways to to set up a situation where our music and what we do is respected and that it's not free. Yeah, know? yeah. Now, by the same token, music is also a community thing. I get that. I'm not saying take everything away and never perform unless you get paid for it. Yeah. But I am saying we need to survive. So That's right. And I think um, the advent of uh, what we're going through at the, at the moment, we'll see... I'm not sure what we'll see post this when we all go back to work, how, how it's going to look, how, how are you going to get paid when you get booked to do a gig, how am I going to get booked when I do my gig, you know, when I'm mixing. So mixing might be uh, a whole other thing now, you know, financially, and so we'll be playing music. So that worries me a little bit in terms of the downgrading of it, you know, the, the um, because I think even things like AFL and the, and the sporting events, their pays are going to be slashed because of the corporate dollar not being invested in it because of what's going on. So the downturn with the sporting events will effectively triple in terms of what we're going to go through, I would imagine, going forward. Yeah. The thing is, it's so fascinating. No one knows. Yeah. And um, look, I wake up with my heart breaking every day, especially for my friends in, in New York. Um, yes. So many artists who were there in the pursuit of truth and beauty, really. Um, and, and it's going to be rough for a long time. Um, and I just feel like I actually feel that Melbourne will actually be a pretty good place um, because it hasn't been hit too hard and there's a lot of sort of fertile stuff going on there has been for quite a while and it's starting to get recognition um but the thing is no one knows you know yeah and um you know fear is the mind killer you know and when fear is gone only i remain so i'm i'm thinking about this idea of we suffer more in imagination than in reality i try not to read too much about all my friends in New York and, and the, 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 the collapsing so that I can be present here in Kono. That's Coburg yeah. North. That's Coburg right. Coburg North is Kono Co from Co now Co on. Kono. Co um, <laughs> Just touching on New York, could you uh, move there, what, in 1997? Is that right? Uh, yeah. 97, yeah. So because we worked together, I don't know if you remember, you came into Woodstock either just before you left to New York or you went to New York and you came back briefly and then you went back again. I'm not sure, but it was one of, it was a jazz album that we worked on and I was really impressed uh, with with you because uh, you had this avant-garde approach to your work uh, by putting a uh, cymbal inside the piano and playing the piano. Do you recall that? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> was that David Rex's album? I think it might have been. I'm not sure who, who it was with. And I thought, this is great, man, because I never, you know, I was the assistant and I never, we were getting all rock musicians and uh, blues musicians in there and this was something else. This was like, great, this is someone who's pushing the boundaries a little bit, you know. And for me it was very exciting. So I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah, no, I think I remember I... I left, I left New York. When I first went to New York was 1989 and I wanted to be like a bebop guy, you know, and I wanted to play some post-bebop or whatever. But when I got there, I started pretty soon working with this guy, Josh Roseman, and this band called The Groove Collective. But through Josh, he kind of like, he kind of showed me like that I was like working within this little circle, but there's, you can go way outside it and it's just open slather. There's no rules. He actually helped me to understand that it's just sound and, and freedom and you make your own rules to the game. And it was experiential because I got to play with some amazing players in Josh's band and they'd all been at um, NEC, which is a fantastic sort of, um, it's a university up there in, close to, to the other, to Berkeley. But, you know, those teachers are like, you know, George Russell, Rand Blake, 
you know, Steve Coleman, Threadgill, all that kind of brilliant thinking outside of the box. So I was sort of in a way influenced by those people through Josh Correct. learning from them and playing with them. And what I'm saying is it kind of changed me. It helped me to understand that you can do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, that's it. Hence uh, your tribute show uh, dedicated to Monk because that is in that realm, yeah? Mm, yeah, well, the Monk thing came about because after the Tawny KX thing that you were talking about, the Global Intimacy record, I kind of, I kind of went down a bit of a dip and I was like, I don't know really what to do, man. So <laughs> then, I, then I played this gig at um, Strawberry Fields and it was just so life-affirming. It was like all this youth and all this amazing music, especially like some of the house music and the, the trance music, it kind of completely changed my thinking. And I actually did a gig up there with some of the guys from Hiatus Coyote and Napalm came and sat in. And it, it, we started at 2 a.m. and went till about 4.30 and they had to throw us off. Wow. But it was just this incredible gear shift for me. And I was like, hang on a minute. Um, so then I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to check out Monk. I know that seems like a strange jump, but Monk is like really such an individual stylist. And I'd been... Up until that point, I'd just been writing original music and getting in my own trip. And I was like, yeah. what would it be like to just go and really explore one of the great masters who's also a complete freak, Yeah, you know? And um, through Monk, then I came out the other side with all these other ideas and I put out a couple of records. Like I put out the record called these two tracks called – one of them's called Sweet Water and the other one's called Precious Energy. And um, – they both got more hype than anything that I've done before. And they're kind of beat orientated too. They're kind of a bit more sort of poppy. But I don't know. It's just these are the these are the sort of ebbs and flows of our of our um, you know, our lives or whatever we do, you know. When Monk was was playing at the Village Vanguard, because I, I I got to play at the Vanguard and I met this the, the the barman there and he said that when Monk was playing there, he played there on a night and there was like hardly anyone in the club and um, he, during the, the drum solo, he got up and walked out off the stage and there was like, you know, maybe four people in there because it was snowing, you know, no one came. Yeah. And, and Mickey, the, 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 the barman came up to Monk and said, hey, Monk, it's one of those nights, hey, not many people. And Monk said, yeah, but you see all those invisible motherfuckers? <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that Monk saw invisible people, all right? He could see the other realms. <laughs> I mean, just listen to his AK. music. It's obvious that he can Maybe see the other he, realms. Yeah, yeah, he can see. He's on a different dimension. Just a question. This is a different question altogether because uh, you worked in Cuba for a little while, and I'm really interested to hear your take on that because uh, that that again is a different uh, rhythm and a different type of music to uh, jazz, you know, it's, uh, it's got the uh, Cuban Afro drums with Spanish guitar and uh, how did you find your place in the world there? Oh, look, um, so, yeah, how many hours you got? I'll, I'll try to be brief, yeah. but I was playing <laughs> with this band, The Groove Collective. We started touring internationally. I mean, they were already touring. I'd, and, um, yeah, and some, there, was a percussion, there were two percussionists in that band and they were deep into Santeria and all those rhythms and went on to be initiated in um, Nigeria, etc. But I was, yeah, so I was listening to a lot of that music and it kind of got me inspired and, and I, I wanted to learn how to play Afro-Cuban piano style, so I went down to Cuba one time to study that. And my girlfriend somehow knew someone down there and they, we found ourselves at this Santerian ceremony for Yemaya, which was one of the deities of, of Santeria. And it fucked me up forever. It was like the most incredible concert. It was just like one guy playing congas, one guy playing a hoe, like the metal part of a hoe, and another guy playing shekere. There was all these dances and stuff. Anyway, it just tripped me out and I started getting investigating this incredible rhythmic music, the bata music, which is the sacred music of Cuba. And then I've been influenced by that music in all the music that I've written ever since. So... But Cuba is an incredibly beautiful place. I did do a little bit of tour. I didn't live there, but I did some touring there and travelled there quite a bit. And um, just just incredible. And I would say that if the, if the embargo didn't happen and it wasn't strangled to death by, by the USA, it would have been even more beautiful. But even so, mm -hmm. a fantastic culture and 
just incredible musicians who it's interesting where it's almost almost like we've all been relegated to a Cuban um, equation in the way, in the sense that there's no money to be made yeah. in Cuba. You're just designated to be a musician. You get the same money as a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. Yeah. You know? And there's this purity in the music of Cuba as a result. Mm. And, you know, I got to meet the equivalent of like, I don't know, like Quincy Jones because, yeah. because there's no hierarchy. It's just like, yeah. yeah, man, let me come into my house and I'll show you some things. And, you know. Beautiful. So, yeah. So, so did you actually play with, did you sit in and play with bands there? And Yeah, I did it. So yeah. what happened is on the second time I went, or maybe, yeah, I think it was the second time, I was at a jam session and, and um, this guy, Bobby Cacases, who's this trumpet player and sort of character of Cuba, said, hey, look, we're going on the road tomorrow, <laughs> right? Do you want to come out for a couple of weeks? Okay. And, and so my girlfriend and I just got on a band bus the next morning and we were just touring, right? And we toured around... It was amazing, man. And we went to this one place, Santa Clara, and we played in this um, this big old theatre. And when they started the concert, um, all these bats flew out and threw the crowd, right? Wow. All these bats were inside the theatre. And then suddenly the lights went off and so we played a little bit with candles, right? The lights just went off because in Cuba the lights just go off. All the energy <laughs> just goes sometimes, right? And we went outside... <laughs> And I kid you not, there were people with lanterns, there were horse-drawn carts, and there's no indication that you weren't in 1920. You yeah, know what right. I mean? Yeah, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. Man. That's incredible. I mean, I can just visualise it. And uh, it, look, it, sound, it sounds like Middle Evil times, you know, uh, with the bats. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, was that because they would obviously live in the theatre, so when music was played, they get freaked out and they start doing their thing. Is that what? Something like that, man. I mean, I don't know. It was just some bizarreness, man. Or, wow. or it was uh, voodoo. Do you reckon it had something to do with voodoo? Don't you try to tie this into your brand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to. I'm drinking, I'm drinking tea, right? Yeah. Because that's what you do. It, it makes a more casual feeling. It Is that does. working? It does because I'm drinking. There's water. nothing in the. There's nothing in here. But I, my only experience with, uh, I mean, I have worked with some Cuban musicians in Australia yeah. when they've toured, and they've been incredible uh -huh. musicians. But I worked with this uh, Native American chap in the early 2000s, and we did a tour up, up to the north of Australia. Yeah. <laughs> the voodoo doll, and um, what? <laughs> And uh, there was this Brazilian guy from the Amazon and talk about tea. And he came up to me while I was mixing and goes, I made you some tea. And I'm, and I'm looking at this tea, man, and I'm going, should I be drinking this tea? Because I said, is it going to uh, erase all the evilness out of my body and my spirit? And he goes, just drink the tea. And I drank the tea, man. And for the rest of the next two days, I just didn't feel the same. Wow. You know, it, and it, it didn't spin me out or anything like that. It was just... It was working more on a um, conscientious uh, thing, like a, 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 I can't explain it. It was just um, something like, and that, and that. So I also did a ceremony with uh, two Native Americans, an Aboriginal, a Tibetan, and uh, an Amari guy in a motel room, and they had the uh, shell with the sage, and they would smoke the uh, area and. Uh, wow. the, we had the peace pipe, you know, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm not sure what to – I still don't know what to make out of that. All I know that the, 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 the Native American chief said to me was everything's an illusion. And I just said, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but let me think about it and I'm still thinking about it 20 years later. So if that's I any kind of agree, I kind of agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know – before yeah. I, I just want to tell you one quick one, which is, I yeah. heard this um, this story of this uh, this Santerian Baba Lao, like a priest of Santeria, going through American U.S. customs, and he had this drum, a sacred drum, right? And so he takes it through, and the immigration guy goes, "We're going to have to open that drum, right?" And the guy goes, "Do not open <laughs> that drum, right?" Really yeah. intense. Yeah. And the guy goes, "You know what? <laughs> I think we're good. You can yeah. go through." <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely, man, because uh, you might end up, uh, you know, with some black spells, black magic put on you if you open up. There it is again. <laughs> um, okay, so you, you had a uh, healthy relationship in New York with Billy Harper. Um, did he mentor you as well while you were in New York? Oh, yeah. I mean, on I played with Billy here. I forgot what year it was. And I just, you know, he, man, he changed my life. Because his drummer at that time... Um, uh, was this guy from uh, Fort Worth. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember his name, but he was the real deal, man. And Billy's music is very deep and spiritual. If anyone's listening to this, please go and check out Billy Harper on, you know, wherever you can. Um, yeah. And so then when when we, when we he left, he said, look, I'll see you on the other side. Yeah, right. And when I got there, he kind of <laughs> took me under his wing and I said to him, hey, man, um, can I study with you? And he said, no, nah, man. He said, just hang out, man. As you know, when I was working with Gil, he just told me we can just hang out, man. So just hang out. He said, "You remind me of Gil, right?" Yeah. Ten years later, he took me out to dinner once a week, every week for ten years. Wow. And I, I you know, I used to go to West Beth, the artist community where he lived in the West Side, and um, yeah, it was amazing. He, he's an amazing character. He used to run every day for fifteen years. Every single day, it doesn't matter whether it was, you know, snowing or, or raining or boiling hot. And he was just a very disciplined cat and he, and he was way into like Hazrat Inyat Khan. There's all the Sufi stuff. Um, you know, I think Miles called him at one time and he said no. Uh, he played with Louis Armstrong. Yeah, wow. He played with, you know, he's in that Lee Morgan documentary. He's just an amazing, amazing person. I feel so honoured just to just know him. You know? And he plays in The Cookers. That's where yeah, I met he him. He came out with yeah, the cookers, yeah. Yeah, that's when when I met him, mm. and uh, yeah, he was a. Um, I, I didn't really speak to him that much, but I only briefly spoke to him uh, at, in the green room briefly, and uh, he was very different to the other guys in the band. I, I could see that. I could sense that that he was more. Um, he had a better under. It seemed to me he had a really good grasp of. Uh, Humanity, I think that's uh, that's the only way well, I could put it. He does know. a lot of meditation. Yeah. And he, to me, the Cookers is his because all the big songs are he wrote them. And yeah, I mean it. It's just yeah, Billy. Billy's heavy. Yeah, definitely. So was was he uh, part of Gary Bartz's um, thing, or was that totally different? No, they're just contemporaries. They're just um, contemporaries. Okay. I've always wanted to put those guys together. That'd be amazing. But yeah, yeah they're friends, and they've yeah. maybe they've played. Actually, I think Gary used to play in the Cookers occasionally, early days. Yeah, and uh, yeah, they just know each other. But yeah, Gary's a whole other kettle of fish. Yeah, and he was your mentor early on in your. Well, Gary's probably more my mentor because I've played yeah. with Gary for twenty years. And, yeah, but Gary's like a mentor, but he's also like a brother. Like yeah. I've never, you know known some of the, I get on so great with him. he's such a lovely person you know and um I just feel like all his band you know like we get on great even though I'm from the eastern suburbs of Melbourne there's no distinction it's just you know human beings and music and I told Gary the other day man I'm not really that good as a musician but when I play with you I can actually play and it almost feels like that sometimes because his band lifts me up so much you know and it's a, it really is a spiritual thing to play with that band I, I miss playing with that band and just seeing, I, just, I saw him yesterday. I was looking at this um, interview that he did on his, um, uh, someone did one on, on Facebook. And um, it's just amazing because he's always so positive, you know. And he said, oh, look, I'm a bit of a hermit, so I'm kind of liking this whole COVID-19 lockdown. And, he, and, they, and the, the, the lady who was interviewing him said, um, don't you miss playing? And he said, well, I'm still playing. I've got all these amazing records and I, you know, mm. I've, I've stayed at Gary's house a lot of times, and you you wake up to him playing along to speak no evil or whatever. So that's one of the things that he does. He likes to because then he gets to play with Elvin, you know. So he plays along with the classic records, even though the solos are going on. He plays along with them. I think it's a great it's a great tradition. A lot of people in America do that, I believe. It must have been an incredible experience uh, living in New York. So you did, you finished your degree at the VCA. You stayed in Melbourne for a little while and then you went to America. Is that how it transitioned or? I, um, 
I did my degree at the VCA, but I started working with Vince Jones in the second yeah. year of that. Okay. And um, then I was barely at the VCA, but I did get my Bachelor of Music, but I was touring a lot. It was amazing, man. Amazing to work with Vince, who was another very influential person. And um, and I, then I, I think I just started going back and forth, you know, to just sort of get my feet wet. And I went back and forth from 1989 to 1997, really. And I, uh, within that time, I was there maybe six months at one time and then two years. Um, and so I was just sort of going back and forth and um, sort of working out how to sort of survive there. You know what I mean? I'm doing in cam. I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm doing the effects for you. Right? I mean, what more do you want? I mean, it's not that. I mean, I love nature, right? But I always feel that I learned so much from the city group. That's good, man. You know what I mean? It's the avant garde series. <laughs> <laughs> I do the effects for you. I'm doing the post production yeah, while I'm doing the actual talk. That's right. Jesus. Talk, that's it. So, so uh, can you give us a bit of a, a demo on your sitar at the back there? I love this thing. It's yeah, absolutely. Bull terrain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's check it out. Beautiful. I don't know what to say. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> man, it's great to do a gig again. I'll tell you that much. Oh, yeah. Uh, man, it's been, uh, yeah, I don't know what to, it's, the last gig I did was with uh, Steve Smith and that seems a million years ago now, you know. The last one I did was, um, it was a great gig, man. I'm so glad that that was my last one. It was Gian Slater's music. Oh, Yeah. And she has a new album coming out, which I produced, which is really, she's so, such a brilliant. Musician. She is. She is. Her, it was Gian Slater and myself and, um, and uh, Chris. Simon Barker. Oh, Simon right. Barker. Okay. Yeah. And um, it was at the Recital Centre. And I was kind of nervous because her music's really hard. And I, I just, oh, sometimes I just don't want to have to concentrate and get my ass kicked. But I did a little bit of practice and tried to work it out, and it just worked really great. And, yeah, great. Um, was that in the salon yeah. or in the uh, main hall? In yeah, the salon, yeah. Okay. The salon, and um, yeah, and I also got to. I went to WOMAD with the whole family, the last WOMAD, which was right on the cusp of um, this COVID thing, and uh, I'm just so grateful that I got to hear that music. Oh my god, yeah. WOMAD was amazing, man. Yeah. And it really gave me a shot in the arm because. I did tour for 20 years around the world. I used to do a lot of festivals and all sorts of things and I used to always get kind of all this influx of ideas and stuff through that. But being just here in, in Australia, which I do love, but I didn't get that and it reminded me yeah. going to WOMAD of, of how many amazing things that you can oh, just yeah. be inspired by. Jeez, that, that's a great yeah. festival. It is, isn't it? I got yeah. asked to mix uh, Calvin Singh many years ago. Do you know who he is? Oh, I love him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got a phone call from someone and uh, I couldn't do it because I was Was that at, in else. WOMAD? Yeah, in WOMAD, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I just want to touch on a couple more things, if you don't mind. 
collaboration, because that's something that you do do a lot of. So what, what's your approach uh, with all the vast amounts of personalities that you deal with through the collaboration? Do you think it's, it has it ebbs and flows, I would imagine? Yeah, definitely. Because I know working with my own music years ago, trying to collaborate with people was very, very difficult. Um, if you want to maintain, especially if, you're, if you've got a friendship and you want to collaborate, it's different if you're professionally collaborating, that, that's a different thing, but it can really uh, work in two ways, I find. It can spoil a friendship or it can actually enhance a friendship. Well, for me, I'm not really interested in friendship and music. Actually, yeah. that's a strange thing to say, but I'm just interested in the best possible music that there yeah. can be. Um, yeah. And friendship is a different thing, but often... Really, my best friends are in, in music, but I'm not really... So, and also, I've become more selective as I've gotten older. Like, I'm just not interested in trying out... If people are just sort of, you know, not ready or, or maybe they've got a lot of talent but they just don't turn up on time, I'm just not interested. But someone like Gian Slater, for example, yeah. um, she's just going to... Every take is going to be perfect intonation and, and she's you know, just open to ideas and it's so fun. And there's someone like Daniel Merriweather is just like... Oh, yeah, he's amazing. Just incredible, beautiful voice yeah. that, like, you can try things. And it's just the chemistry, you know. We get on so... Both those people, you know, we get on great. And then working with Vince Jones. Yeah. In that situation, I was much more a, a youngster and learning from him. And I definitely gave him some good stuff and wrote some good things with him. Um but again, it was just so fun and magical to work with all these people because, um, yeah, I think the the sort of the feeling of the people is what's most important in music. I remember Brian Eno saying, you know, you can have certain mics and all sorts of cool gear yeah, and that's all that's, good. That's right. But it's really about how the people feel when they record. Yes. That's the main thing. And yes. actually, you know, when I made that one record in Cuba, uh, Mother of Dreams and Secrets, I had studied all this Cuban stuff and then I wrote songs based on some of those rhythms and took them back to Cuba. And um, we recorded all the percussion and bass and piano in Cuba and it was like this cheap, it was like Pro Tools 5 or something, Pro yeah. Tools 6 and all these cheap Russian mics and terrible, it was a whole crazy situation and actually at the end of the session I remember going in, I'd, I knew a little bit about Pro Tools and I was like, can I just check where those files have wound up? And they were all over the shop, so I did a safe copy in, thank God, and got them out of there, right? But yeah. what was interesting is, like, once it was mixed by this guy, Hiro Sonata, this guy who does most of my stuff, who lives in New York, a fantastic, like, um, Japanese cat, people would say, man, how did you get the sound on the congas? You know, how'd you? I'm like, man, that was the worst equipment possible. It's just that those guys are so good. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. And that's what I find... Uh, uh, I've experienced, uh, you know, working with some really great musicians that you, you don't need the best mics, you don't need, because it's the, they give you the sound. They, they've got good instruments, they know how to play it, they know their dynamics, they know the feel. And that's a trick for young players, I guess, uh, to understand that, which can take a long time to grasp that, you know. Yeah. But just getting back to the collaboration, because that album that you did uh, with Daniel Merriweather, Global Intimacy, that was all collaborated, was, is that right? You did a lot of collaboration work on that album? That album was sort of my album under a pseudonym and I just called all of the people that I work with or people that I really liked and just made every track is a, is a collaboration with, with various people. Some of them are just done over the internet and some of them with people in my house here. Um, and actually, I stole Banksy's artwork for the cover of the album. Yeah, right. And I wrote to him and said, you know, can I use the cover? And he said, oh, look, I don't usually, you know, I don't release anything, so good luck with it. And I wrote back to him and said, I don't want to lease it. I want to steal it publicly. <laughs> I said, I said, you know, you've done these amazing things and, and, and sort of decimated public property I just want to put some sonic graffiti on your image. Yeah, exactly. He never got back to me. But actually, yeah. just recently I wrote to him again. I sent him um, this PDF of some ways to um, sort of um, avoid getting COVID, and he actually wrote back. He said, uh, thanks awesome. for the PDF. So he does get back. Just go on his website and you can chat to him. Okay. And um, 
What that PDF you sent him is that remedies for the COVID or is it? Yeah, do you uh, want me to send it to you? Yeah, that'd be great. It's this. It's this kind of whack guy. He's, but he, I've I like some parts of what he what he's into. That you know the what is it medical medium or whatever his name is. Oh, yeah, I, he's, he's into celery, celery, juice. celery juicing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, I yeah. think yeah. It, it was that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I've got it because Julia Messenger sent it to me. But uh, um, I've got some information regarding the COVID because I. I do yoga and I had a virtual coffee yoga catch up yesterday with some of the ladies from Carlton and yeah. uh, there's a number of doctors who are um, in that yoga class and when everyone went off it was just myself and one of the doctors and she told me that uh, the covert has uh, mutated. So uh, basically she said there's A, B and C and Australia has currently got A and a little bit of C. She goes, but uh, Italy, Spain and China have got A, B and C. And she goes, when you've got those three, she said, it's going to be mayhem. And she said, we just got to hope that it doesn't happen in Australia. She goes, but C, we, we've got a little bit of C and, uh, and then we got cut off because she ran out of uh, time on her Zoom. So it was real... It was a real insight because then I just thought to myself, the media is not covering that. I haven't heard anything about that. Yeah. Well, there's so much conflicting evidence and stuff. As I said earlier, like I know what I need to do and I, to, to, to be the best I can be mm. for my family and, and myself yeah. and people around me. Um, and to, I just can't get too involved in all, all sorts of theories and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I want to try to just keep, Equanimous, <laughs> really? Yeah. No, no, and, and because I, I it's, it. it's a long haul, but it's going to come out the other side. But you know, I'm going to people will fall by the wayside. It's a long, it's a long game. It is. It's got to it be is. a long game. And you know, I love Gary Bartz is saying, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm quite enjoying it. I'm shedding and reading, and you <laughs> yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's interesting to see how people, you know, and Gary's got such a beautiful sunshine about him, and that's why because he stays positive, man. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm. I'm trying to be that, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I didn't mean to bring up any. Uh, I don't think you were. You know, I wasn't saying that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying there's so many people who have facts about it, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, she's a doctor, so she would. I yeah, think she has sure. a good grasp on things, you know. But um, I noticed you got a Hammond organ in the back there. Is that a Hammond organ you got there? Is that a? Well, actually, it's a Kawaii. Um, oh, okay. It's a beautiful instrument that Simon may even turn me on to. Um, it's a three-tier organ and um, hang on, I'm just going to play. Should I play a little bit of it? Yeah, it's sure. plugged in. Hang yeah. on, wait. So it has these beautiful analog sounds at the top and it was built in a time when all the analog stuff was like, you know, really that was just the norm. And then it has yeah. like this beautiful string sound in the middle. And some rich, you know. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a bloody beauty. And when I, what happened was Simon has one in his studio, Simon Maven, and I just sort of loved it. And then he sent me a link. Hey, there's one in Geelong. So I went up to Geelong and the guy who sold it to me, he, he said, when I bought this organ, it cost me $20,000 in the 80s. It was wow. this top of the line, you know, thing. And I also bought, he said, I also bought the property next door for 20000 Wow. He said, I'm wow. selling you this organ now for $250 <laughs> yeah. and the property next door is worth 320000 Exactly. Enjoy your life as a musician. That, that's a great story. <laughs> Isn't that a great, that story? A great story? I mean, you could buy oh. a property for $20,000 and a musical instrument for $20,000 in the 1980s. I mean, what a... And, and you know, it's be it is beautiful, but like, yeah. You know, Has, the so, it, so the speaker's in the bottom of the... Organ or yeah, is it? it's got actually it's got a Leslie in there, small Leslie. Yeah. But I actually on on Daniel's recent record, Daniel just released a track called Rain that we produced together, and I play um, that organ but through a Leslie. And yeah. I've set it up in my house, and um, yeah, it sounds fantastic, man. It's, it's 
I've also on on the last two re- those tre- tracks that I was mentioning, Precious Energy and Sweet Water, which are the top two ones on my <laughs> streaming atrocities. Um, they have the, that keyboard all over it. It just sounds so good. Even the drum track, there's like a little beat thing in there, kind of. So yeah, it's it's been a great thing. I've got all sorts of stuff in here. I've got um, uh, uh, Rhodes over here, a clavinet, and I've just someone just helped me set up the piano. Um, I can kind of show you. Oh wow! Oh, wow. So I just put those two pencil mics. I've got some Rode yeah. MT5s there, and someone yeah. helped me set a little. Um, the little um, stand for it, so they just so, so they're already set up. So anytime I just want to record something, I, I can do that. You yeah, know? great. So when you when you're working with Daniel, is it is he in England recording, and then he just send you the stems, and you record, and you send him the stems? Is that how you do it? All, all the work that I've done with Daniel was in this studio here. In okay. fact, Dan, okay. he loved it, and he was like, I can't sing anywhere else, and yeah, he would right. only sing after twelve midnight, and it was this yeah. cr- crazy scene man because we worked yeah, on the album for yeah. about six months and um yeah and and he also sang on my album i did this re- record hearing the blood and i had this track called love is the blood and yeah i had yeah. i had sung some kind of weird vocals in there he goes man they're two take six man let me do it i'm hearing something and he, <laughs> he was called a jet lag and he just because i've got this ampex three three fifty one preamp that's the only kind of decent yeah. equipment yeah. i have and so we just put an SM7 through that and he kind of recorded it on the spot and that's what's on the record and it was just like this thing that happened, you know. I mean, that's a great album too. Yeah. Oh, thank you, man. But, um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, Dan, he's in London now, but actually I think he's getting hold of some equipment to, um, to, to record himself, so that's kind of... <laughs> It's amazing. I do all the post-production for you. Yeah, that's the one oh. I like. I like that one, mate. Hang on. This is good. This is good. <laughs> yeah. That's great. All right. Well, um, I want to thank you for your time, mate. It's been it was great. It a pleasure, man. Thanks for, the, thanks for your time and, and, no and good luck with your, with your podcast. Let me just say I want to send my love out to all of the musicians and everyone in the industry and, you know, just try to hang in there, stay equanimous through it all. and That's it. We will come through because we've been coming through for our whole entire existence. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. I love your jacket too, mate. I've got one of those. Oh, thank you. Well, one day we'll go out again. <laughs> exactly. Wait, I'll put, when I go out, there'll be so much cologne on, right? <laughs> <laughs> it'll be, it'll be horrifying, but people won't. Yeah. People still won't care. Yeah, I want to put extra it. cologne on. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's it. Smell, Smell the roses. God bless us and save us. That's right it, out, Mrs. Mate. Davis. That's it. All right, Pete. Good on you, man. Take it Thanks. easy. Good on you, buddy. Thank you, mate. Take it easy. Bye. Dead when voodoo strikes, it'll tear apart your head when voodoo.